The National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture, presents U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. The National Farmers Organization, a pioneer of collective bargaining, the market system to meet the needs of the 20th century, presents Who is the National Farmers Organization? Your moderator is Ivan Straczynski. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report. While the world has been catapulted into the space age, today it is very important that you listen to this program because this program will be affecting everyone. We will be talking about food. Specifically, we will be visiting with the people that produce this food. I'm sure that this will be a very interesting program. We'll be talking about milk. We'll be talking about grain. We'll be talking about meat. While the National Farmers Organization program and philosophy can be enlarged to other products, the principles remain the same. We feel that there is a great misunderstanding. In other words, there are a lot of muddy waters in respect to the terms that the good people in the National Farmers Organization are using, and we hope that as a result of this program, you will have a better understanding of us and the people that bring you the good food that you enjoy every day. We have with us today three people from Eastern Iowa. They are leading farmers in their professions, and certainly farming is a profession. We do provide the nation with a great abundance of food and fiber. We have with us today Mr. Richard Schaefer, who farms in Lynn County. We have Mr. Oren James, who farms in Benton County. And we have a farmer's wife, who I might say in all sense of the word is a farmer, Mrs. Luella Bursner from Iowa County. We will be visiting with these people today in the spirit that as a result of these discussions, you will have a clear understanding of who is the NFO. While this is a broad subject, and I'm sure that many of you are hearing about collective bargaining for agriculture, these are the people that are doing things about collective bargaining for agriculture. Without further ado, we'll visit with Dick Schaefer, who is known to all his friends in the NFO better as Dick. Dick, what type of farming operation do you have? Well, I even, <clears throat> I farm 320 acres here in Lynn County, Iowa. It's all tillable ground. We raise corn, uh, oats, hay, feed a few cattle, uh, Raise a few hogs, got a herd of dairy cows, milk 20, 24 cows. Even got a few chickens around the place just for our own eggs, and oh, we market a little grain. <clears throat> Basically, this is about ours. I have 180 acres of corn in this year, and corn's going to do probably 100 bushels to the acre. Price is terrible, but uh, we really got a good crop of it, anyhow. Well, fine, Dick. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about why you feel that the American farmer? needs collective bargaining for agriculture under the National Farmers Organization program. Well, I even, I believe that we should have, or do have, a basic right. Uh, we never, we never have had it, and this is the right, or the freedom, whichever one you want to call it, to price our product. And this is what we're after in the National Farmers Organization. This is why I joined the organization, because I want to gain this right for myself and for my children. I hope we can set up an organization that uh, will give my children, if they're going to produce farm commodities, uh, a method or a means by which they can price the fruits of their labor. Uh, we manufacture farm products, let's price them. This is why I joined the NFO. In other words, it's <coughs> business. Definitely. We're in business just as much as uh, uh, a company, General Motors, Ford Company, General Electric, Westinghouse. Uh, don't mean to uh, 
name any particular company, but uh, we have a business and we, uh, we manufacture a product. We're the ones that knows or should know what the costs are. Uh, we know that we need a little profit too to stay in business. And uh, actually it should be the farmer's responsibility to price the production of his farm. We've never done this. We've always let somebody else do it for us. We've never accepted this responsibility. We need to accept it in this day and age. Well, this sounds as a sound program to me, Dick. Would you go into a little bit more of a description of some of the terms that we have come to know in the National Farmers Organization as our terminology? In other words, we just use these words assuming that everyone understands them. Would you like to expand on some of these, Dick? You mean I would like the holding action and marketing Very arrangements good. and so on? Well, Ivan, I think this has been a basic uh, misunderstanding of a lot of people. Uh, generally, we're talking about wanting to, uh, uh, well, as I said a little bit ago, we want to price our production. Now, generally, uh, in the situation we're in today, we need to raise these prices. Uh, what are the, some of the tools you do this with? I think the uh, thing in my mind that a lot of people don't understand is that we have a lot more tools that we use besides the holding action. In a lot of people's mind, I believe, and this is, is totally wrong, the holding action is our only effort at raising prices. Uh, I made up a little chart here, Ivan, and I'd like to go to that at the present time. And. Uh, you know, this pricing of, of uh, farm products and, or this business that we're in is kind of like a little game. We're kind of on one team and you've got another team that's your opposition. This is the same uh, in agriculture as it wouldn't be in any other business. But let's say that this is kind of like a football field here. And I've drawn out a, a picture of a football field here. I hope you people can all see this. Uh, but up here is our goal line. I should make some, a picture of a goal post up here. But our goal is marketing contracts for cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Now, how do we get to this? Well, here are some of the ways that we get to this. Holding action. This is one of our players on the field. Marketing arrangement. This is another player on our field or on our team. Store and hold program in dairy product. This is another player. Phase two program. This is another player. The grain bank. Another player. This is in the grain. Harvest sales of grain. Instant sales of grain. Collection points for meat. Uh, in position grain sales. Master contracts. We've got a lot of programs. The thing I want to drive home here, Ivan, is the fact that holding action is only a small part of our total program. True, this is probably the only thing that a lot of people hear about the NFO. When the holding action's over, they think we go home and aren't working at it. But we're working at this day and night, every day, every week, every month, and have been for several years here. We're making gains. Uh, we have processors that are accepting production from us through these marketing arrangements at the present time. We're moving grain through our grain, uh, instant sales. Uh, in position grain sales, uh, master contracts have been signed with processors. So the point I want to get here, we have a lot more programs than just this holding action. Now this is fine, Dick. I would suggest that in the uh, space of time we have here that, of course, we'd like to explain a lot more of these terms to you so that you do understand them. However, because of the lack of time, I would suggest that you contact your friendly NFO neighbor member and visit with him and get to know him and he get to know you get acquainted and he can help you to understand what some of these terms are moving on we'd like to at this time visit with mrs luella bursler from iowa county would you like to tell us a little bit about your farming operation uh, we live in iowa county uh, we farm 240 acres we have um, corn, soybeans, we raise hogs, and we feed our fat cattle out. We don't buy any and run a fat cattle lot, but we do feed our own calves. Well, fine, Luella, thank you. Why 
do you feel that farmers need the National Farmers Organization? Um, I believe that agriculture is possibly the most misunderstood segment of our national uh, economy. I think that it is far more important to the overall economy of the nation than most people realize. I think that uh, many people fail to realize that farmers are the largest consumer of steel, of rubber, of petroleum, and that they produce the commodity that that is the most essential to the prosperity of any nation, and that is food and fiber. And I suppose selfishly, next, I consider farming as a way of life. And we intend to preserve the family farm system in the United States through the National Farmers Organization. And the farmers' problems can all be condensed in one short phrase, low farm prices. And I, um, the NFO is endeavoring to get um, the farm prices uh, to a level that is profitable to the farmers to start the money through the economy um, at the farm level. This will save when we spend it with our small town business. They will in turn spend it with their uh, larger cities, and that will keep all of us in business. And this would benefit every segment of the economy to have the farm prices profitable so that farmers would have money to spend. We intend to accomplish this through the National Farmers Organization by bargaining together and selling together. Well, fine, Luella. I do know that, of course, here we're speaking with producers and our conversation tends to hinge around the producer portion of food, in other words, the farmers telling their story. I do know that consumers, we all are, we are all consumers of food, and we should be concerned with if the farmers do get a fair price, how will this affect my food budget? I think this is one of the areas that is mostly and one of the biggest areas that is misunderstood. Would you give us an example of how much does a farmer receive or what portion of a commodity, say such as milk or eggs, does a farmer receive on the consumer dollar? Well, first of all, I think possibly if farm farmers um, uh, prices were raised at the farm level, that it might increase the, the consumer prices that they pay at the retail level. However, I don't necessarily think that it would have to. Um, for example, the farmer's share in this loaf of bread uh, is two and a half cents. If we would raise the farmer's uh, profits or the farmer's share of this loaf of bread, it would only raise the price of this loaf of bread two and a half cents. And that would raise the farmer's profits 100%. You can take a, a quart of milk. Um, if the farmer's share of the quart of milk is 10 cents, uh, you can raise um, if a quart of milk would raise one cent, that would increase the farmer's income by 10 percent. Well, I think that this would be, um, I don't think that the consumer realizes what a small percentage of increase it would take to, to raise the farmer's level of income. And uh, we are organized in the National Farmers Organization under the Capper Volstead Act. And this also protects the consumer. It gives the farmers a right to bargain collectively together, but it also protects the consumer as to the high prices that the farmers couldn't um, price them. In other words, uh, Luella, here you're saying that uh, the consumer uh, has protection under the Capital Allstead Act also in the event that farmers do get organized to the extent where they could raise the prices of food to a great extent, is this correct? Yes, that's right. And, but um, I think more important to every housewife uh, should be the questions 
that if farmers do not get fair prices, who is going to control the food production and how much am I going to pay for food when farmers no longer produce it? Um, with corporation dividends in the last 20 years have increased 232%, while the farmer's uh, percentage has dropped 12%. Well, uh, I do not think that the elimination of farmers is going to make food cheaper in the United States. Uh, in fact, when corporations have charge of, of producing the food, of processing the food, and then of retailing the food, um, they have a chance then to set their price on all three phases of this um, operation. And I do not think that the elimination of the family farm is going to make them, so I think that it should be more important to them that they wonder uh, who is going to control the production of food rather than how much food uh, it's going to raise my prices of food if farmers get fair prices. Well, fine. Thank you, Ella. Now, to further uh, support this theme of yours, uh, would you give us an example of how many dozen of eggs it would take, for example, to, uh, to fix your hair? Well, um, at the present price of eggs, it would take approximately 12 and a half dozen of eggs uh, to fix my hair at the beauty shop. This would be if it was all profit. Now, you do have some cost, I understand, in the eggs. That... <laughs> well, uh, with, uh, they figured that uh, it costs approximately 27 cents to produce a dozen eggs, so I don't know how much it would take for me to, to fix my hair with losing eight cents or nine cents a dozen on a dozen eggs. Well, thank you, Ella. We'll get to you, back to you in just a moment. Uh, next, we're going to move over to visit with Oren. And uh, would you tell us a little bit about your farming operation, Oren? Well, I'm, uh, consider, I consider myself a general farmer simply because I operate a diversified farming operation. I raise somewhere between three to 400 head of hogs a year. I feed out my own uh, cattle uh, produced from my own beef cow herd. We milk a few cows to kind of help out with uh, the daily needs. I raise approximately 115 to 20 acres of corn a year and 20 or 30 acres of beans, and the balance being in oats and pasture and hay ground. Well, we've been discussing here collective bargaining for agriculture, and we hope that you, as a result of this, will better understand the producers and the farmers telling this. Now, or would you tell us a little bit why do you feel that collective bargaining is the answer for the American farmer in respect to pricing his production? Well, I think it's the answer because uh, there are too many farmers out here going broke. Uh, and there hasn't been anything else that has worked to, to solve the, the basic problem of price uh, as long as I can remember. This is why I think it's the answer. Would you like to comment at this time about the uh, law of supply and demand as you see it, Orrin? Well, the law of supply and demand, as we have always understood it, uh, means that whenever we produced, overproduced, uh, the demand wasn't there and the price dropped. Or that when we underproduced, the demand was, was over and above the supply and the price was supposed to rise. Uh, this is the concept that we've been operating under. However, I don't quite think that this is the way the rest of the economy uh, understands the law of supply and demand. Uh, I think the rest of the economy says we will produce a supply and demand a price. And this is the way the American farmer uh, should, uh, this is the way the American farmer should get in the position to do also. All right, well, thank you, Orrin. Dick, do you have any comments at this time that you'd like to make in respect to? Well, Ivan, mean, it seems like, uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of people here, but uh, you know our forefathers come into this country and and uh, there wasn't too much here. And it hasn't been too long ago. And they had to set up
school districts, county governments, state governments, federal governments, they had to dig out roads, they had to build cities, they, gee, they had to do so many things. Surely in our generation, it wouldn't be too much to ask the American farmer to set up a marketing system for agriculture, which will let the young man start with a little bit of nothing, the middle-aged man maybe make a few dollars, the older man to kind of cut back, retire, and enjoy life. You know, it seems like we're coming to a society in which you've got room for a little bit of everything but people. And this is something I think we need to stop and think a little bit. Let's make room for these young people. Let's give them an opportunity. Uh, machines and so on are available today that probably are in here, and uh, Mrs. Burstler and, uh, and her husband and my family and I, we could farm a tremendous amount of ground. But I've got three sons. I'd like to see them be able to come into farming. Now, they don't have too much, and I, I think this is good. Uh, a little ambition, but I'd like to set up some kind of a system where they could start with this little bit of nothing, grow, raise their families, support their schools, support their churches. In other words, let's build a society for people. This, is, to me, is the important thing. But surely, in our generation, it's not too much to ask us to set up a marketing system for agriculture when our forefathers had so much else to set up, governments, roads, and so on. Well, this certainly sounds good to me, Dick, and I'm very proud to be able to visit with you and the other NFO members and neighbors, and certainly it has been educational to me. I certainly feel that I understand the National Farmers Organization goals and people much better at this point. Now, let's move to Mrs. Burstler, known better to her friends in NFO as well. Uh, why do you feel that farmers should have better prices? Well, first of all, I think that this is a land of plenty. There's, and we want to keep it that way. But to accomplish this, we must pay our farmers enough that they w to make it possible that they will have enough to buy the equipment and to pay the costs of raising livestock, to, to live, have money to live on the farm, to uh, feed our people and to clothe our people. And um, I think that uh, uh, we should have to have uh, raised the farmer's income enough that it will be a financially attractive to the young people. We need young people in farming. Farming, uh, the average age of the farmer is becoming, a, well, I don't know, 57 or, or approximately that. We have become a business of old people. And, and we need these young people to, to come back into farming. Any business in America that does not have young people coming back into it is a dying business. And for, to produce this abundance of food, we must have young people coming back into agriculture so that they can raise this abundance of food that we have always enjoyed in the United States. Well, thank you, Ella. One of the basic things I think that should be remembered is that only farmers and farm producers can belong to the National Farmers Organization. Number two, that it is a grassroots organization that people such as these that you and I have been visiting with here today are working the organization. We hope that the title of this program, Who is the NFO, has been answered to a point at this time that it is neighbors, it is NFO, farmer members who is the NFO and with all the philosophies and with all the mechanics of the National Farmers Organization program we hope that we are helping you to understand the National Farmers Organization which very simply put is bargaining together and selling together now Dick do you have any comments you'd like to make at this time well uh, I've got the membership agreement set in here, Ivan, and uh, I uh, talked to a few people 
on membership agreement. To me, uh, this, this is a good part of NFO. It lays out a program or a system by which we accomplish the things we're talking about. Um, I'll read one sentence for this thing. It says, I authorize the NFO, its agent or representative, to act for me as my exclusive representative in collective bargaining in respect to all commodities marketed from my farm. Uh, I serve on a bargaining committee for milk. Now, if I went in and authorized uh, and tried to bargain for a price for somebody for orange milk and he had authorized me to do this, I'd be doing something illegal. So this to me is a real important part of the membership agreement. You authorize somebody to bargain for you. Down here a little ways, we elect the people that we authorize to do this. Over here a little further in the membership agreement, after these people have bargained for us and secured a contract, they must come back to us for their, for our approval before we are affected by it. Um, what does it cost to belong to the National Farmers Organization? It costs $25 a year up until the time that we are actively selling under marketing contracts, which we have approved. I see. Well, getting back to your uh, football field description here reminds me that uh, this is somewhat of the basic rules applying it to a football game that right. the players have agreed to abide by. Uh, Ivan, I have something here that I would like to uh, comment on here regarding Dick's football field. I noticed at the top uh, the holding action. And I think that this is the most misunderstood part of our whole program. We simply got to realize that when we bargain with a processor and he says, no, do you sell your production anyhow? Or do you make up your mind you're going to get a price and hope? Well, thank you. We feel that a result of programs such as this, and we'd like to, that you will better understand the National Farmers Organization, and we hope that you will contact your friendly NFO member. We have them in some 25 states, as I understand. So may I end with this one word? Think and also keep informed. Thank you. U.S. Farm Report has brought you the special program with Ivan Straczynski. The members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel of our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth from a new generation of new American farmers. The National Farmers Organization is the organization that devotes its time, effort, and resources to preservation of the farm family structure and private enterprise in America. Tune in again next week at the same time for another edition of U.S. Farm Report.